Hello, I'm Ron Charles. You may know me as the fiction critic for a major American newspaper. No, not that one. I've recently become aware of a young upstart, some Gary Steingurt, who's blurbed perhaps 120 books, whereas I have reviewed 750 books, many of which I've read. But if this Gary Steingurt is such an esteemed and formidable figure in the literary world, does he have the courage to blurb his own book? Well, this Gary... While this Gary Steengort is flinging his blurbs off the high cliffs of Manhattan, we here in the Beltway are crafting unimpeachable literary appraisals, such as my recent review of Gary's book. A slit your wrist satire, illuminated by the author's absurd wit. This may be the only time I've wanted to stand up on the subway and read passages of a book out loud. Oh. <laughs> Gary Steingart spent his first seven years in Russia. It was hard and tough and there were many men with mustaches, but there were good team building exercises for the kids. I mean, I do feel like Gary is Russian. I really do. I, I know a lot of Russians and I feel like Gary, like I am of Russian heritage and I feel like there is a Russian temperament. A new nation was waiting just nine time zones away. There was a brand new apartment in a brand new city. Airfare was cheap. Frequent flyer miles were non-existent. Well, when Gary Steingart um, first um, came to New York, he was a he was a very confused um, young Russian boy, and he grew into a very confused youngish but slowly middle-aging Russian man who wrote uh, books. That wasn't all he wrote. <clears throat> what a splendid, funny, bewitching book. A startling, necessary novel. Funny and touching. Digressively brilliant. Bespeaks of his superior talent. Hysterical and moving. What a glorious novel. Punchy, hilarious, and apparently even true. He is the Balzac of blurbs. I feel you need some alliteration when you do things like that. He blurbed this. It was an unusual situation because I had, I'm a blurb whore myself and I blurb anything that comes my way. And so uh, I wrote an article about confessions of a blurb whore for the New York Times and I figured I had to talk to the man who is even more of a, well, I don't know if he's more of, but he is, you know, he is a legendary blurber. I needed to talk to him. I emailed him and, uh, and he provided me with some great wisdom about blurbing and his blurbing philosophy, which is, he says that he blurbs, uh, he's very strict requirements on what he will and will not blurb. It must have uh, two covers, a spine, and an ISBN number and then he will blurb, and he will blurb hard. I remember one day I was sitting, and we were talking about the Steingart blurbs, and someone, uh, may have been one of them, may have been me, said, oh, we should start a Tumblr. And so I just did right there, because we were sitting in a coffee shop with our laptops, and I started adding a bunch, and then a few days later, he sort of took off. Occasionally, I'll wake up and think I've perhaps had some dream of Steingart blurbs, perhaps some thought that there was a a Kieran Desai book I overlooked with a Steingart blurb, or uh, a Ben Marcus book that I didn't know about. You know, some new phrasing that Steingart has come up with in one of his latest blurbs, a savvy use of an exclamation mark or something like that. I think that Steingart is sort of like a mystic when it comes to blurbing. He can lay hands on a book and kind of through a, a quasi-spiritual process, a literary osmosis, kind of come to understand a book's true essence and then transmute that into the proper blurbage. You know, it's really an art form. It's like a poetic construction. And I like the fact that Gary made a play on my name. He read it in the AM and finished in the PM. So I thought that was good. I like that he referred to me as Miss Holmes because sometimes people refer to me as Mr. Holmes. Um, so I think we're making steady progress. Um, I don't worry, especially with someone like Gary, about the flippancy of it because I think that Gary, of all people, understands that everyday life is in fact so serious and simultaneously absurd that one must make fun of it and, and play with it because otherwise it's just too excruciating. He's spreading the love 
Um, he's he's you know representing his group of friends. I, I think he is a friendly guy, um, and. I, I, I am a little suspicious. I feel like Gary Steingart exists outside the blurb equation. Like he's, it seems like at this point he's blurbing so prolifically or he continues to because now it's a big joke that we're all in on in the industry. I do think it's sincere. I hope it's sincere. <laughs> you know, as a book critic, unless the blurb is from um, Herman Melville or Thomas Pynchon, I, I don't. I don't care. And uh, neither one I understand blurbs very much these days. It's what I call provincial paranoia. As uh, uh, William Burroughs said, paranoia means having all the facts. And uh, all the facts in this case is that they really are all friends of each other. Officially, they have no influence at all. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, I know deep down that they do influence me. Uh, I am impressed by good blurbs, even though I know they're friends of the authors, even though I see them in the acknowledgments, that I know they took classes from them at the Iowa Writing School. I still, it still has an effect, and, it, and I'm ashamed of that. But where do blurbs come from? How did these snappy little sentences of praise become a prominent bite-sized fixture on today's book covers? A key clue can be found in bovine of an unusual hue. I feel like the term purple cow triggers some bizarre childhood uh, sense memory. I have no thoughts on purple cows. I would like to see one. In 1895, a bohemian poet named Gillette Burgess wrote a poem for a magazine called The Lark. I never saw a purple cow. I never hoped to see one. But I can tell you anyhow, I'd rather see than be one. And after he became, he was an illustrator and a, you know, and a writer and a general sort of writer of, of, of humorous things and the Lark was sort of a McSweeney's of its time and he wrote a follow-up poem after that was all that he was known for in the way that Christopher Walken might be annoyed that he's only known for more cowbell at this point. In 1907 a limited edition of Burgess's book Are You a Bromide was presented at a trade show dinner. The book featured a special promotional cover with a photo of Miss Belinda Blurb caught in the act of blurbing. The term stuck. Um, I seem to recall that he was a fan of Ken's work. We got back a blurb pretty instantly after he read it. Our sales force asked if we could put it on the front cover. And I, I have to hold up this incredible jacket design. These are the galleys. But, um, you know, we decided that this is not a cover that you mess with. You know, a certain generation of reader um, you know, immediately sees an acronym like OMFG and thinks, this is a book for me. It can get in the way sometimes. Um, and I think that with, with this book, I'm pretty sure that they had, they had the blurb intact. I would say it wasn't so far um, removed from the, the beginning phase of this thing. And sometimes you do, you do a cover and it's like, oh, I'm really excited about this. And then they send back this blurb. I'd heard rumors that he was teaching at Columbia, but I'd never seen him. We have an agent in common, but I actually think he just read this story and, and offered to take a look at the collection because he's a good man. The whole idea that anyone was gonna publish a book that I had written was so like, felt so fragile that I was just not asking questions. So if there was some, if my agent like sent Gary a fruit basket, these things I don't know. If Gary like needed a favor, if he was like, hey, wash my car, I would do that. Maybe Gary doesn't own a car. Maybe he needs me to wash, like, watch his docks and take, take, go pick up the dry cleaning. Like, I would love to do a favor for Gary. There's a way that he's capable of offering a sincere blurb while also poking fun at the whole idea of the blurb, which is kind of like a swami magic. I don't know how he's doing that. I had his personal email and I sent him a note and I got a response, I would say, in 10 minutes. We consulted right there in the bar. I don't think he'd even read the book yet. He just decided to give it his endorsement. Actually, he was my first blur. And the only one I was able to get personally. Uh, yeah, I was burned by the authors. <laughs> and I used influence. I didn't call cold. I did use a certain amount of, you know, networking or whatever. A low level, I, I, I might add. Uh, to try to get some kind of famous author on the team. But I don't know, I was, they didn't even, I, I don't, I wouldn't take it personally, but it did, it, I was burned. It's the worst. It's worse than auditioning for a movie. There is something that I find so 
so incredibly humiliating about it because uh, you know writing a book this is my first book of fiction it, you feel incredibly vulnerable to s sort of be jumping into this um, arena um, where you're just a relative newcomer but he was my first and your first is always special I will always be predisposed to like a Gary no matter what he does in his life <laughs> he will always hold a place in my heart no matter what, I just, I, you know, the fact that he, he put himself out there before anybody else did, I thought was incredibly decent of him. He didn't have to do that. I mean, you put in an uncomfortable position asking someone for a blurb, and I get a lot of requests, and you've got to pick and choose carefully, and if you know the person, it's hard to say no, and so on and so forth. So I think the world would be better without blurbs, but it's part of our business. He could have sent me out of the office crying, but then I would have left his office crying, and, you know, nobody wants to see that. I don't know if you have to read the whole book from start to finish sometimes maybe you have a very good sense of what's happening after three quarters of the book or two thirds of the book. Uh, occasionally Gary's been known to front me a, a Benji when I need one. He actually really likes doing it. He actually seems to enjoy exuberantly blur reading and blurbing books and I think he enjoys seeing his name on the back of a book just as much as the front. I mean, he's like the Robert Pollard of blurbs, you know what I mean? Like, you, he's, he's doing the equivalent of four albums a year. So, you know, at some point you're just going to have to change things up. to blurb these. These are great. <laughs> this one is called The Story of My Purity by Francesco Pacifico. So this must be Italian. Mm -hmm. Next March we will publish The Story of My Purity by the young Italian writer Francesco Pacifico. It's an utterly original novel, delightfully neurotic, equally at home with our king Christian theology, American pop music, and the suburban Ikea. And I've come to think of it as the Roman Catholic answer to Portnoy's complaint. I hope you enjoy it. If you do, and felt able to offer some words of praise for it, I'd be grateful and thrilled. It's very hard to say no, because I think, you know, the way, one of the things that, one of the reasons I do blurb is that when I was just starting out, uh, I met um, Cheng Ray Lee, the author, and he helped me publish my first book. He sent it to his editor, she bought it, he blurbed it, um, and it was the nicest thing anyone's ever done for me. The more I blurb, the more people want me to blurb. It's it's a irrational exuberance. It's like the housing bubble, but but with blurbs. It used to be that these things mattered quite a bit, and one honed one's literary reputation over the years. But with the state of literature as it is, uh, there's no honing necessary. I do have to say, I am pretty proud of my blurbs. I think, I think some of them are really really good. You know, um, I think my favorite blurb was when I blurbed uh, Edgar Carrot, and I said something like. Uh, better than Leviticus and just as funny, because he was an Israeli writer, so I was doing an Old Testament riff. I'm trying to get people to read good, serious literary fiction, or funny literary fiction, uh, and no, no hyperbole can be hyperbolic enough, because very few people want to read this stuff. Uh, I read them, some of them, through, completely. I mean, these two books I'm going to read like crazy, oh my god. Uh, but, you know, on some books you just read for as much as you have time to read, and then you get a general sense that it's something you would enjoy reading to the end if you had the time. Well, these are all people I'd be happy to be in a hot tub with, you know. I mean, these are wonderful men and women, and uh, I'm not going to extend the sexual metaphor beyond the hot tub, but we are all swimming in the same wonderful water. Well, what, what I want is for the publishers to stop asking me to blurb. You know, I can't, it's, it's a market valuation of what my blurbs are worth. If publishers think that the blurbs can only hurt the book, then they'll stop sending me these things and then I'll be free. But are any of us entirely free? An author writes a book, rolling her ball down the great alley to publication. Sometimes you get a strike, sometimes it's a gutter ball. But the takeaway from any game is the fun you have when playing it.